Let's get to the book of Numbers. As you can see, I'm not too anxious to move into this thing, but uh, censuses never did turn me on. And um, yet, uh, there are some interesting things that I think that uh, we need to take note of here in the book of Numbers. So we read, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of meeting, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they had come out of the land of Egypt. So they have stayed in the area of Sinai for two years and one month at this point. In the second year they came out of Egypt. They came out in the first month, so this is the second month of the second year. So two years now in the area around Sinai. And the Lord commands him to take a census. Now this is interesting in the light of the fact that later on David got into trouble for taking a census. Here Moses is ordered to take a census. And the census is to be of the men who are over 20 years of age. Those men who would be able to go to war. And so uh, they first of all chose men from each of the tribes to head up the census for that particular tribe. And so it names from verses uh, 5 uh, through 15 the various tribes and those men who were chosen to represent that tribe as far as taking of the census. And then these men gathered together and they recited their ancestry by families, by their father's houses, according to the number of names from 20 years old and above, each one individually. That must have been one boring day. <laughs> As the representative of the tribe of Reuben got up and named all of the families of Reuben, and the numbers within that family. And then each representative of the tribes in turn standing up, giving the names and the numbers and then the total numbers of that tribe. And so rather than, well, we'll just sort of take the total number, which we find interesting. Now, the census was taken again some 38 years later, just before they went into the promised land. After the 40 years wandering in the wilderness, the second census was taken. And it is very interesting to compare the figures of the first census with the second census. One thing we note is that during this 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they had more or less achieved a zero population growth. The population at the end of the 40 years was basically the same as it was the beginning of the 40 years, which speaks of the rigor and the hardship of that wandering in the wilderness. Of course, we, as we get into the book of Numbers, are going to find out that many times as they murmured or complained against the Lord, they were plagued by the Lord, they were smitten by the Lord. Uh, a lot of uh, catastrophes befell them, which wiped out a lot of the people. And so it accounts for the zero population growth. Think of how much the population has grown in the United States in the last 40 years. As you look at the census figures from 1940 to 1980, uh, we see that there's been quite an expansion of the population. Uh, a zero population growth is a hard thing to attain. 
and yet the rigors of the uh, wilderness experience, that's what happened. Now, the tribe of Reuben, at the first census, there were 46,500, verse 21. In the 26th chapter, at the second census, there was only 43,730, so a population drop in the tribe of Reuben of the adult men of almost 3,000. Close to 3,000 drop in the tribe of Reuben. The tribe of Simeon, there were 59,300. It really was decimated. Less than half of that were left in the tribe of Simeon. At the second census, there was only 22,200. So the tribe of Simeon was really decimated during the wilderness wanderings. The tribe of Gad, there were 45,650 men above 20 years of age who were able to go to war. And so at the end of that period of time, there was only 40,500, a, a drop of about 5,000 in the tribe of Gad. From Judah, at this census, there was 74,600, verse 27, but at the end of the 40 years, Judah actually proliferated and they had 76,500, an increase of almost uh, 2,000 men from 74,000 to 76,000. The tribe of Ishkar in verse 29, 54,400, but they really multiplied in the wilderness. Maybe they didn't have TV. Uh, 64,300 uh, at the end of the 40 years. The tribe of Zebulun grew from 57,400 to 60,500, so an increase of 3,100. The tribe of Ephraim reduced from 40,500 to 32,500, so a drop of 8,000. The tribe of Manasseh grew 20,000 from uh, 32,200 to 52,700. Benjamin grew from 35,400 to 45,600. 10,200 increase. Tribe of Dan from 62,700 grew to 64,400, so a little over a thousand. And the tribe of Asher grew from 41,500 to 53,400. The tribe of Naphtali, verse 43, from 53,000 it was reduced to 45,400. So a drop of uh, 8,000 in Naphtali. Now at the beginning of the wilderness experience, there were 603,500. 603,500. At the end of the wilderness experience, there was 601,730. So there was a drop in population during the 40 years of wilderness wandering of approximately uh, 1,200 men, which isn't, you know, it's, it's pretty close to a zero population, uh, a drop of, of about 1,200 over the 40-year period. Now, we do remember that all of these that were numbered here, 20 years old and above, all of these that were numbered here, only two of them were allowed to go into the land. Joshua and Caleb. The two spies that brought back the good report. God allowed them to go in the land. Of all of those that were over 20, the Lord said they will roam in the wilderness until they die. And only Joshua and Caleb, above 20, will be allowed to go into the land of promise. So this whole census here, 600,000 men, 600, 603,000, 
perished in the wilderness as God raised up a new generation in that 40-year period of time to go into the land. Now, when you consider that there are 603,000 men above the age of 20 able to go to war, it gives you then an approximation of the total population of those that Moses took out of Egypt to bring to the promised land, and there was probably something about 3,500,000 people. I mean, that's a mob to take out into the wilderness. Imagine, say, uh, imagine, say, deciding that we're going to all migrate from here. Um, let's say to uh, Blythe, Colorado River. We want to colonate that area along the Colorado River. And so we're we decide to take off from here. Now, you know, get buses out of your mind and cars and vans and motor homes. I mean, we're going to walk. And we're going to camp out. And we're going to survive off of the desert until we get to Blight. And though the distance from here to Blythe is about the same distance that they went to get to the land of promise, they were wandering in that wilderness for 40 years. And imagine doing that with 300 people. Imagine all of the logistics involved in this thing. I mean, unless the Lord was with them and unless the Lord had provided the manna and the water and all, they would have surely perished. They were learning in this period to trust in God for their survival. I would imagine that these were probably the best and the healthiest years in the nation. How wonderful it is when we are consciously depending upon God for our survival. Now we do always depend upon God for our survival. David said, if it were not for the Lord, let all of Israel now say, if it were not for the Lord, then we would have been totally consumed by our enemies. If it weren't for the Lord, we'd all be wiped out. But we're not always aware of that. You see, we're so often looking at our own abilities and our own genius and our own wisdom and our own conniving and always say, well, you know, I learned to get along and I can do this and I can do that. And, and we're learn we so often are attributing our survival to something other than God's preservation. It is good when we realize, when we are conscious of the fact, I am dependent upon God. And to be consciously dependent upon God is a very healthy state spiritually. And so these people were in a healthy state in that they knew that God was necessary for their survival and without His help they weren't going to make it. Now, the tribe of Levi was not numbered in this census because the tribe of Levi were not to go to war. Their primary duty was to take care of the things of the tabernacle and they were to camp immediately around the tabernacle. Now, in the second chapter, God sets out the camp of Israel. And it is good... Now here, let me give you a little assignment and I think that you'll find this extremely beneficial in helping you just sort of to get the picture. You who want special credit for the course, draw out a diagram of the camp of Israel. The tabernacle is here in the center of the camp. And to the east, you have the three tribes of Judah, Eshkar, and Zebulun. 
And when they get ready to move, these are the first to move out. So God says, okay, time to move. Move out, troops. Well, Judah and Ishkar and Zebulun are the first to roll up their tents and to get things ready. And they start moving first. First to move out. And then on the south side of the camp, over here, you've got Reuben and Simeon and Gad. And they are the second to move out. And then on the west side of the camp, you have the forces of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin over here. They're the third group to move out. And then over here on the north side, you have Dan and Asher and Naphtali. They're the fourth group. And then comes the tabernacle with the Levites. Now, draw on your diagram the tabernacle in the center of the camp and then draw around the camp those tribes. And for special credit, put the population of the tribe. And then the total population of each groupings of three. Twelve tribes, uh, basically really thirteen when you, if you count the tribe of Levi. But the three on each side around the tabernacle... And you get the picture of how they move, the orderliness, and, and how God set the whole thing out in order. And, and that, to me, is, is always interesting to observe. Now, the thing to really note is that the tabernacle was in the center of the camp. By which God was declaring the strength of the nation is in, when God is at the heart or the center of national life. Oh, I've thought how often it would be so glorious if we could live in a community where God was the center of the community. Where we were all conscious of the fact of the centrality of God within our lives, within our community. So as they would pitch their tents around the tabernacle, they would always pitch the tent door facing the tabernacle. So when you came out of your tent in the morning, the first thing you saw was the smoke of the sacrifice, the morning sacrifice, ascending up to God. And it gave you that consciousness that God is in the midst of His people. God is in the midst of the nation. I love that. I think that that's absolutely beautiful to have this consciousness. God is in the midst of His people. He dwells in the center of the nation. And as long as that consciousness exists, the nation is strong, preserved by God. Now, as you look at these tribes... We do get the total number of each tribe given to us. That is of the three tribes. With the tribe of Judah over here on the east side. Verse 9. The totaled out the, the, the fellows that could fight. They totaled out at 186,400. On the south side over here with Reuben and Simeon and Gad. Their total number was 151,450. And then over there on the west side, with Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, they had 108,100. And then on this uh, north side, with Dan, Asher, and Naphtali, a total of 157,600. And so that's how the camp was set up. But then closest and immediately around the, the, the tabernacle itself was the tribe of Levi. So in chapter 3, verse 2, these are the names of the sons of Aaron. 
Nadab, who was his firstborn, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Now, Nadab and Abihu were wiped out. Uh, they died before the Lord the day that the tabernacle was uh, inaugurated, the worship was inaugurated, when they offered the strange fire before the Lord. And so uh, the tribe of Levi was commissioned to attend to the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the ministry within the tabernacle. And God declares in verse 12 that he has taken the Levites for himself from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore the Levites are mine. Now, you remember when the final plague came upon the Egyptians, the death of the firstborn. How that when the blood was put upon their doorposts, the firstborn were not slain. But in all of Egypt, in all of the houses of Egypt, even to the Pharaoh's house, where there was no protection of the blood, the firstborn was slain that night in Egypt. That night that God passed through the land of Egypt, wiped out the firstborn. Now, inasmuch as the firstborn were not wiped out in the camp of Israel, God said, the firstborn really belonged to me. From now on, the firstborn is mine. If you want to keep your firstborn son or daughter, you've got to actually redeem them from the Lord. They belong to him, so you've got to buy them back from the Lord. First is his. Uh, that's sort of the way God always works. The first is his. He, he comes in for the first part. And so uh, God had said, the firstborn always belongs to me. Well, now God is saying, Instead of the firstborn, the whole tribe of Levi is mine. And I'm going to take the tribe of Levi as mine instead of the firstborn of the land. So God uh, had them, interestingly enough, number then those of the tribe of Levi, and they also numbered uh, the firstborn to make sure God wasn't getting shortchanged. And it turned out that he was. That there were uh, a few more uh, firstborn than there were in the tribe of Levi. So uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's go ahead and sort of plod through a bit. Uh, the first family of the Levites that was numbered was the family of Gershon, verse 21. And of the family of Gershon, there were 7,500 males from 30 years old to 50 years old. Now, with the Levites, you could not enter the priesthood until you were 30 years old. That basically is why Jesus didn't begin his public ministry until he was 30 years of age. You could not enter into the priesthood, the work of the priesthood, until you were 30. And when you were 50, then you were retired from it. Now, the work of the priest was not all involved in worship. Much of this was involved in just being porters as they would carry the tabernacle from place to place. Now the tribe of Gershon was on the west side of the tabernacle. Let's get it back up here again. Immediately next to the tabernacle on the west side was the tribe of Gershom. So close to it, God sort of kept a, uh, a buffer between the tribes and the tabernacle. And the buffer were the, were the tribe of Levites. And so they were camped close around. The family Gershom of Gershom, who was the Levite, they were here on the west side, 7,500 
males between the ages of 30 and 50. Now, their duties were when the tabernacle was to be moved, they were to move the tent with its coverings, the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and the screen for the door of the court and the hangings of the court, which are around the tabernacle and the altar. So around the tabernacle here was this, was this cloth fence, seven feet high. They had to carry uh, that fence. They had to carry uh, the, the tent that was over the tabernacle here and the screens that were out in front and then here at the door of meeting. Next of all, we have the family of the Kohathites. And there were 8,600. And they camped on the south side, immediately adjacent to the tabernacle here. And their duty included the ark, carrying the ark of the covenant, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the utensils, and the screen and all of the work relating to them. And then from the tribe of Merari, or the family of Merari, there were 6,200. They camped over here on the north side. And they had to carry the boards of the tabernacle, the bars, the pillars, the sockets, the utensils, and all of the work that related to them, the pillars of the court all around, and all around this court were all of these posts that held up these uh, uh, hanging cloths. And so they had to carry all of the pegs and the sockets and the post. And they were to camp over here on the south side. And then out here in front to the east side, Moses and Aaron and their families. So they're directly in front at the entrance of the tabernacle. Close around the Levites and then further around the 12 tribes. So... Hopefully you got the picture, and if you'll take and draw it out on a piece of paper, it'll help you tremendously to, to, to get this whole thing uh, fixed in your mind. Now, the census was to be taken of Kohath, verse, or chapter 4. Oh, this redemption, yes. Uh, now, they were to number all of the firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month old and above. So they went through to take a census. How many of you are firstborn, you know, males? From one month old and above. And they, uh, they Levites, were to substitute for, for the firstborn. So when Moses numbered the firstborn, verse 42... They came in verse 43 to the names and so forth, and there were 22,273 firstborn. And so uh, there were not that many Levites. The total of Levites didn't come to that, and so there was a shortage there, and so they had to redeem then the difference. Uh, that is... They had to pay five shekels of silver uh, per person for the difference in the numbers. Uh, and uh, these were to be brought unto Aaron. Now, in the duties, the, uh, actually the duties fell upon those from 30 years old, verse 3 to 50. This is the service of the sons of Kohath relating to the most holy things. When the camp prepares to journey, when God's cloud moved and it's time to move on, the pillar of fire begin to move, and they prepared for the journey, Aaron and his sons would come into the tabernacle and they would take down the, the covering veil, the uh, veil that shielded from the Holy of Holies, and they would cover the Ark of the Covenant with this veil. 
And then they were to put a covering of badger skins over that. And they were to spread over the badger skins a cloth of blue. And then they would insert the poles through those hoops. So that when the Kohathites came in to carry the Ark of the Covenant, they never saw it. It was covered with the veil, which was covered with, a blue, uh, with badger skins, and then was covered with this blue cloth. So they never saw it. That work was done only by Aaron's family. The work of breaking down the Holy of Holies, covering the Ark of the Covenant, and then also the table of showbread. They were to spread a blue cloth, over it, they were to put the dishes and the pans and the bowls and the pitchers for pouring, and the showbread should be on it. And they shall spread over the blue cloth a scarlet cloth, and they will cover the same with the covering of badger skins, and then insert the poles. And they shall take a blue cloth and cover the lampstand. So actually, by the time even the priest came in, they did not see the furnishings of the tabernacle. They did not see the lampstand, the table of showbread, the altar, the Ark of the Covenant. These were all covered by Aaron and his family. And so uh, they are to cover with a blue cloth the lampstand with its wick trimmers, the trays, the oil vessels with which they served it, and all of the utensils with the covering of badger skins, put it on a carrying beam. And so these guys, you see, were porters. The Levites were porters. They'd just come in and carry these things. They'd pick up these beams, pick up these poles, and they'd carry uh, the uh, furnishings. The, the tribe of Kohath actually carried the furnishings of the tabernacle. They also were to take away the ashes from the altar and spread a purple cloth over it. Notice the colors, blue cloth, scarlet cloth, purple cloth. And they shall put on it all of the implements which they minister there, the fire pans, forks, shovels, and so forth. And so when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all of the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them, but they shall not touch the holy things lest they die. Even the tribe of Kohath, Levites, they couldn't touch. These only, you just pick up the poles, you don't touch the Ark of the Covenant. You don't touch the table of your bread. You just pick up the poles. Now, God was serious about this. You remember when David went to bring back the Ark of the Covenant after it had been uh, taken by the Philistines and uh, carried to carry at Jerem. Uh, David finally decided to bring it to Jerusalem, so he sent a bunch of guys out, and they came out, and they were having these big dances, carrying, they, they put the thing on an ox cart, and they were bringing it back to Jerusalem, and the ox cart hit a rut and started to tip, and Uzzah reached out to steady the thing, and when he touched it, he died. And David said, leave it right there, I don't want to bring that thing around my, you know, and, and he went it back to Jerusalem. And, and he was there at Kiryat Jerem where Uzzah touched it and was, was killed. And so David went back really shook over this. And uh, later on when he decided again to bring it in, he looked up the records and he realized, hey, this thing isn't to be put on an ox cart. You don't touch it. You carry it on poles and, and you, don't, you don't mess with the Ark of the Covenant. And so David did it the second time the right way and brought the Ark of the Covenant back. But even the priests themselves were not to touch it. It was to be touched only by Aaron and his sons as they would prepare the thing. They, they were sort of like packers who come to your house and they pack things up and then the, the movers come the next day, but they've got everything all packed and ready to go. And so uh, when the Kohathites would come in, then Aaron and his sons would say, okay, you guys, you grab, you grab that pole, you grab this pole, you grab that board, you know. And, and they would direct the guys in, in picking things up. But it was all done in a very uh, orderly fashion. And so, uh, Eliezer, the son of Aaron, had to take the oil for the light, the sweet incense, the daily grain offering, and the anointing oil, and the oversight of the tabernacle and all that was in it. That was his particular duty. 
And um, Aaron and his sons, verse 19, were to go in and appoint each of them his service and his task. But they shall not go in and watch while the holy things are being covered, lest they die. In other words, they don't go in until it's all prepared, and then Aaron and his sons, say they direct it, just like I said. He said, okay, you guys pick up that, you guys pick up this. And they directed the whole activity. The tribe of, or the family of Gershom, they're all Levites, but the family of Gershom, their service in the tabernacle was to carry the curtains, verse 25, and the coverings, the badger skins that were over it, the screen of the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen of the door of the gate in the outer court, the hangings of the outer court that are around the tabernacle, and the altar that was in the outer court, and the cords and all of the furnishings, they were to carry those. And their duties were to be under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron. He was to oversee what they were doing. And then the family of Mirari, their duty is to carry the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets. And of course, if you'll remember back in Exodus when they made the tabernacle, these boards were about 18 inches wide, a couple inches thick, set in sockets of silver and so forth with these uh, poles that went through the silver hoops to hold them upright and all. And, and so these big boards overlaid with gold, they were the things that uh, the Merarites had to carry. So it was, it was quite a task, you know, breaking the thing down, moving it on. Uh, quite a job, but yet it was organized so well. God had things just really organized to a T, and so Aaron and his sons, proficient, knowing how to do things, would direct the service. But these fellows who were, they were just really sort of just porters and uh, coolies, you might say, laborers. That's why later on, some of the sons of Korah got together with some of the other guys and they said, you know, this isn't fair. We're Levites. And they just have us lugging this stuff around. We don't get to do any of the fun part, offering the sacrifices and all. We have every much right to offer sacrifice as Aaron. The only reason why Moses chose Aaron was because he was his brother and they got this little thing going, you know. It was because they wanted to... to move into this other area of, of service other than just carrying the stuff. You know, we want to get in on the, uh, on the sacrifice and the worship aspects. And uh, we'll get to that uh, as we move through here and find out what happened to Korah and his little group of rebels. So, that's the way things moved. <laughs> now in chapter 5, Moses was commanded to put out of the camp all of the lepers. And anyone who had a discharge, or whoever becomes defiled by a dead body, uh, they had to be put outside of the camp. This, of course, was uh, for hygienic purposes, both male and female, they are to be outside of the camp. Notice God said, in the midst of which I dwell. Again, to have that consciousness of the awesomeness of God's presence, anything that was unclean had to be put outside of the camp. Why? Because God was dwelling within the camp. I'm dwelling in the midst of the camp. And so in the midst of the camp where I dwell, don't want anything that's unclean. Put them out. Now we get to an interesting... Uh, well, when a man or a woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, the person is guilty, he's to first of all confess his sin which he has done and then make restitution for the trespass in full, adding a fifth part. 
and give it to the one he has wronged. So not only did you have to pay back, if you cheated someone, not only did you have to pay them back the amount that you cheated, you had to add 20%. You stole something from somebody. You not only had to give them back the, the full value, you had to add 20% to it. Restitution had to be made. And then if the, there was no kinsman, uh, say that the person died and you owe restitution, he doesn't have any family, then you have to give it to the priest. And uh, it belonged then to the Lord. Now, this interesting law concerning unfaithful wives. <laughs> Man, it was tough, women. You, you've really come a long way. If a man's wife goes astray, behaves unfaithfully towards her husband, and another man lies with her carnally, it's hidden from the eyes of her husband, and it is concealed that she has defiled herself because there was no witness against her, and she wasn't caught. If the spirit of jealousy comes on her husband, he becomes jealous of his wife, who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes on him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself. Now here's the, the rub. You may be living with a jealous man. He may be suspicious. It's possible that there are no grounds for his suspicion. It could be that you're just as faithful as any wife could be, but yet he's, he's just suspicious and jealous. And if he gets jealous and suspicious of you, then he brings you to the priest. And you bring an offering that's required for her of one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. Don't put any oil on it. Don't put any frankincense on it because... It is a grain offering of jealousy, an offering for remembering and bringing for uh, iniquity to remembrance. And so the priest brings her near and sets her before the Lord, brings her into the uh, tabernacle area there. And then he takes some holy water in a uh, clay vessel. And he takes some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and he puts it in the water. And then he stands over the woman and he takes her headband off, her, her head covering, the uh, sort of hood that they wore. And he put the offering for remembering in her hands, this little barley cake, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have in his hand bitter water that brings a curse. And so he will put her then under an oath. And say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and you have not gone astray to uncleanness while under your, while under your husband's authority, be free from the bitter water that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while under your husband's authority, and you've defiled yourself and some other man other than your husband has lain with you, then... The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people when the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. So he sort of puts a curse on her. When you drink this water, if you're guilty, may your thigh rot and your belly swell. If you're not guilty, may nothing happen to you. <laughs> and, and so the woman then had to drink this bitter water. Now imagine if you had an extremely jealous husband. I mean, every week in there drinking bitter water, <laughs> going through this whole routine, you know, of you know, your thigh rotting and your belly swelling, you know, uh, if you're guilty. May this water that causes the curse go to your stomach and make your belly swell, verse 22, and your thigh rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, so be it. <laughs> you know, if I'm guilty, all right. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall sc 
scrape them off into the bitter water, and then he'll make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and the water that brings a curse shall enter into her and become bitter. And then he offers the uh, grain offering and so forth. Uh, now, when he has made her to drink the water, it shall be if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell, her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among the people. But if she's not guilty and is clean, then she will be free from the curse and will be able to conceive and bear children. The law of jealousy. When a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray, defiles her spell, or the spirit of jealousy comes on him and he thinks that she is guilty. Interesting that they didn't have any kind of a reverse thing on this. A wife couldn't bring her husband if she was suspicious of him or jealous of him. Uh, there was no provision for a wife. As I say, women, you've come a long way. And uh, this... Um, Interesting, interesting. Um, you know, if you were guilty, holding this offering in your hands, the priest is going to cover your head and, and he puts his hand on your head and he says, now, you know, when you drink this bitter water, may your thigh rot and your stomach swell and you say amen so be it you know man when you drank the water there'd probably be enough uh you know chemicals being created in your system uh that would probably poison the water and and actually cause it i mean it would be uh feeling the guilt and knowing you're guilty and having ascended to this curse uh probably you know if it be studied out from a uh, purely scientific standpoint of, of uh, the chemicals that are ex excreted from the various glands when I'm telling a lie or whatever, you know, probably would cause the, this very thing to come to pass. If you're not guilty, no problem, except you have to drink that dirty water. Uh, but that could get tiring after a while, too, I'm sure. Next week, as we move on, we get into the law of the Nazarite, a very interesting law, and we'll study it in the light of uh, Samson and, uh, and Jesus, for Jesus was uh, to be known as a Nazarene, the vow of the Nazarite. I thank God for you, and may God just richly bless you for putting out the effort to be here tonight, that we might gather together and study the Word of God and learn of His truth, that we might walk in the way of righteousness, that we might live a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. And that we might learn to put the Lord at the center of our lives and build our lives around Him. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord bless you. May His hand be upon you this week. May He strengthen you by His Spirit. And may He just bless you abundantly all week long, in Jesus' name.